By the time a man reaches 50 years of age, he has a 75% chance of having an enlarged prostate and a 33% chance of having prostate cancer. As he continues to age, these numbers continue to worsen. It's an accepted medical fact that if a man lives long enough, some kind of prostate problem is virtually guaranteed. Prostate problems are not, however, inevitable. There are six main causes of prostate problems. These are hormonal imbalances, cancer, zinc deficiency, cadmium toxicity, calcification, and infection. In this audio presentation, we will discuss each of these six problems in detail and then for each problem tell you which natural ingredients are most effective at addressing each particular problem. Should you want a product with all of the ingredients for each of the problems we are about to discuss, they are available in the endosterol product. Now, let's begin with hormonal imbalances and cancer, as these two problems are intimately related. Up until his early 30s, a man produces more testosterone than estrogen. Yes, you heard right. Men produce estrogen. This is natural and is nothing to worry about. Men produce estrogen and women produce testosterone. The difference is that men make more testosterone than estrogen and women make more estrogen than testosterone. It is this predominance of one hormone over the other that is responsible not just for the differences between male and female bodies, but also the differences between male and female personalities. Unfortunately, as a man ages, he makes less and less testosterone and more and more estrogen until by age 34, a man makes more estrogen than testosterone. I call this a hormonal inversion. This process accelerates with age, so that by the time a man is 60, he makes twice as much estrogen as testosterone, and by age 90, 12 times as much. While somewhere in a man's 50s, this change is officially labeled as andropause, which is the male version of menopause, you can see that the process actually starts in a man's mid-30s. A hormonal inversion can show up in many ways. In the sports world, a man's performance begins to suffer. This is why you don't see many professional athletes at the top of their game past age 40. Muscle size and tone decreases, and fat begins to accumulate. This gives a man a softer, more feminine appearance. In the business world, a man may begin to lose his competitive edge. In relationships, he becomes more passive. In general, as the hormonal inversion begins to take hold, a man becomes more sensitive and less aggressive, more feminine. Regardless of how you feel about the effect of female hormones on your personality, the male body doesn't like it at all. In particular, this hormonal inversion wreaks havoc on a man's prostate. Hormonal inversion or the dominance of estrogen over testosterone in man, is due to three actions. First, as a man ages, he makes less testosterone. This is understandable, as all hormones decrease in their production with age. Second, some of his testosterone begins turning into dihydrotestosterone, or DHT for short. This happens courtesy of an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase, whose job it is to convert good testosterone into its evil counterpart, DHT. It's DHT that is the main cause of hair loss and prostate enlargement. Did you ever wonder why baldness is predominantly a male problem? It's because men make more testosterone than women and thus are at greater risk of having more testosterone that turns into DHT. The third cause of hormonal inversion is a bit more bizarre. It turns out that there is an enzyme in a man's body called aromatase, whose function it is to convert testosterone into estrogen, and not just any kind of estrogen, 
because there are actually three different types of estrogen. This aromatase enzyme turns testosterone into the most powerful of the three forms of estrogen, namely estradiol. Thus, as a man ages, he not only makes less testosterone, but what little testosterone he makes, his body then turns into DHT and the estrogen estradiol. Now, we already know that DHT causes hair loss and balding. What does estradiol estrogen cause? Aside from feminization of the body and personality, estradiol causes cancer, and most specifically, prostate cancer. So, just what are the odds of this happening to any given man? As we said in the introduction, in terms of prostate enlargement, by age 50, 75% of all men have an enlarged prostate, and by age 50, 33% have prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is the most common non-skin cancer in the United States, and the second leading cause of death from cancer among U.S. men after lung cancer. As a man gets older, these numbers get much worse, and if a man lives long enough, Prostate enlargement and cancer are virtually guaranteed. Medical treatments for an enlarged prostate and prostate cancer often leave men in diapers, unable ever to have sex again. So what do we as men need to do? We need to increase testosterone production, block the enzymes 5-alpha reductase and aromatase, and find some way of dealing with a prostate that has already become cancerous and enlarged. Alternative medicine has identified many natural ingredients that can help us do this, but the best of all of them are beta-cetosterol and elagic acid. Beta-cetosterol suppresses both 5-alpha reductase and aromatase so that takes care of DHT and estrogen. In terms of prostate cancer, animals treated with beta-cetosterol had 43% smaller tumors and had one-half the rate of metastases over untreated animals. Elagic acid works by causing cancer cells to actually self-destruct. The technical term for this is apoptosis. Whenever a cell becomes cancerous, our DNA instructs it to self-destruct. This is one of the most powerful safeguards we have in preventing cancer. Unfortunately, some cancer cells manage to block this signal. These are the cells that go on to grow and form tumors. What elagic acid does is to reinstate the self-destruct signal in these cancer cells. Elagic acid does this for all cancers but studies show that it is particularly effective at this for prostate and breast cancers. So, what should we do? Go out and buy some beta-cetosterol and a... Well, first, you need a concentrated source of beta-cetosterol, and even the saw palmetto berry, the plant recognized as one of the best sources of beta-cetosterol, contains only 333 parts per million of beta-cetosterol. <laughs> to get one gram of beta-cetosterol from saw palmetto, you would need to have over six and a half pounds of saw palmetto berries. Furthermore, beta-cetosterol is very poorly absorbed orally. Less than 5% of what you take by mouth makes its way into the bloodstream, and then even less gets to the prostate itself. Thus, to absorb one gram of beta-cetosterol a day from saw palmetto berries, you would actually need to eat over 132 pounds of the berries a day. Elagic acid is found in raspberries and pomegranates, but again, we have the same problem with absorption and concentration. Unless you have the digestive capacity of a 500-pound mountain gorilla and you spent all day stuffing yourself with saw palmetto berries and raspberries, you would need to get a more concentrated source of beta-cetosterol and elagic acid. So, the first two ingredients we chose to put in endosterol were concentrated forms of beta-cetosterol and elagic acid. Okay, that takes care of the first two problems, 
hormonal inversions, and cancer. Let's move on to problem number three. The third cause of prostate problems is zinc deficiency. A zinc deficiency not only causes the prostate to operate less effectively, it can also cause it to enlarge. Different organs in the body have different requirements for elements, and for the prostate, zinc is required. It may sound strange that some organs need more of one element than another, but you already know of the most common example. It's called goiter. While the younger generation may not be as familiar with this, the older generation will be. Goiter is an enlargement of the thyroid gland in the neck due to insufficient iodine in the diet. Iodine is a heavy element, and rain typically washes it out of mountainous soil into the rivers and eventually into the sea. People living near the oceans who eat fish get all the iodine they need, but people who live in the mountains often become iodine deficient and can develop goiter. Of course, this isn't seen much anymore in developed countries where iodine is added to table salt, but it demonstrates the point. Individual organs, or glands, have specific mineral requirements, and when they don't get what they need, they malfunction and can enlarge. Thus, prostate enlargement can be considered prostate goiter. Unfortunately, zinc is not added to table salt like iodine is. This, added to the fact that zinc becomes more difficult to absorb with age, leads to the widespread zinc deficiencies we see today. Keeping in mind that we not only need to supplement with zinc, but deliver it to the body in a highly absorbable form, the third ingredient in endosterol is pumpkin extract, which is high in bioavailable zinc. The fourth cause of prostate problems is cadmium toxicity. Cadmium toxicity is actually related to zinc deficiency in the sense that low zinc levels can cause cadmium toxicity. Cadmium is a toxic heavy metal, commonly found in soft drinks, seafood, cigarette smoke, plastics, water softeners, and other places. Cadmium can cause chronic fatigue, hair loss, high blood pressure, arthritis, impotence, and, of course, prostate problems. Cadmium owes its unique ability to damage the prostate to its similarity to the element zinc. Now, all beneficial elements have their toxic analogs, poisonous elements that the body mistakes for the beneficial ones. This is due to similarities in the atomic radius and electrical charge of certain elements. Thus, the body mistakes aluminum for magnesium, lead for calcium, mercury for selenium, and cadmium for zinc. Now, the prostate needs zinc to function, and it is often zinc deficient. So when it sees some toxic cadmium floating by in the bloodstream, it thinks, oh, good, here's some zinc. I need that, and it gobbles it right up. In this manner, over time, cadmium accumulates and begins causing problems. If a man were to take supplemental zinc his whole life, it would offer some protection against cadmium absorption, but even so, some cadmium is bound to make it to the prostate. The only way to deal with cadmium is to remove it with a chelator. A chelator is an ingredient that has a very strong attraction to a particular element. If the attraction it has is stronger than the attraction the body has for that element, the chelator can pull that element out from the body. The safest and most effective cadmium chelator is called EDTA. EDTA is an amino acid that has a 50-year history of removing toxic metals like cadmium from the body. Once EDTA has attached itself to cadmium, the entire complex becomes water-soluble and will be eliminated harmlessly in the urine within a few hours. Thus, EDTA is the fourth ingredient in endosterol. The fifth cause of prostate problems is calcium deposits in the prostate. We've discussed cadmium, and we can agree that it is a toxic metal. But what about calcium? 
Isn't calcium vital for our health? Absolutely. Calcium keeps our bones and teeth healthy and has many important roles to play in our biochemistry. What is not commonly known is that as we age, calcium migrates from the bones and teeth, where it belongs, into the soft tissues and organs of the body. When calcium does this, it turns from a beneficial mineral into a pathological one. When calcium moves into the kidneys, we get kidney stones. When it deposits in the gallbladder, we get gallstones. When calcium migrates into the arteries, we get arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis. When calcium gets into the joints, we get arthritis. And when calcium gets into the prostate, we get prostatic calculi, also known as prostate stones. In addition to being a gland, the prostate is also a small pump. And like any pump, it needs to be free of debris to function properly. As we age, these tiny prostate stones accumulate, reducing the prostate's health and functionality. Now, there are two ways to remove prostate stones. The first is a medical procedure that involves a catheterization. Ouch! The second is with EDTA, which goes in and pulls the calcium out, just like it removes the cadmium. Thus, EDTA serves double duty, supporting both the removal of toxic cadmium and also calcium stones. The last cause of prostate problems we will address is that of infection. In addition to cancer, the prostate is susceptible to bacterial, viral, fungal, and parasitic infections. You will recall that ellagic acid is the ingredient used in endosterol to decrease cancer risk, but it does much more than that. Ellagic acid is truly a remarkable ingredient. Ellagic acid is antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, and antiparasitic as well. Ellagic acid is such a remarkable ingredient that it is well worth learning a bit more about it. Ellagic acid inhibits all bacteria by inhibiting the enzyme gyrase. Gyrase is only found in bacteria, and it is the enzyme that allows bacterial DNA to coil. Without this enzyme, the bacteria's DNA unspools and the bacteria dies. Unlike traditional antibiotics that are specific to certain bacteria, ellagic acid works on all bacteria. Since gyrase isn't a human enzyme, inhibiting it does us no harm. Ellagic acid inhibits fungi and yeast by inhibiting the enzyme chitin synthase II. Almost all fungi and yeast cell walls are built out of a polysaccharide called chitin, and chitin synthase II is the enzyme they use to make chitin. Thus, by inhibiting chitin synthase II, ellagic acid suppresses the growth of almost all fungi and yeast. Again, chitin synthase II is not a human enzyme, so inhibiting it does us no harm. Ellagic acid inhibits many viruses by inhibiting the enzyme integrase. Integrase is an enzyme that many viruses need to enter a cell. As you know, viruses cannot reproduce without entering a cell. So by inhibiting this enzyme, many viruses can be inhibited. Again, integrase is not a human enzyme, and its inhibition does us no harm. Finally, ellagic acid inhibits parasites, but the mechanism of how this happens is not yet fully understood. While many people believe parasitic infections to be limited to third world countries, many people harbor millions of intestinal parasites their whole lives without ever knowing it. Thus, in addition to the effects of ellagic acid on prostate cancer, ellagic acid also deals with the infective aspect of prostate disorders. Ellagic acid is also an ingredient in endosterol. We have now discussed the six main causes of prostate problems, hormonal imbalances, cancer, 
zinc deficiency, cadmium toxicity, calcification, and infection. We have also discussed the ingredients best suited to deal with these problems, namely beta-cetosterol, elagic acid, pumpkin extract, and EDTA. The last question to be answered is, in what form should these ingredients best be administered? The answer is, as a suppository. Suppository administration was chosen as the delivery mechanism for endosterol for two reasons. Firstly, rectal absorption is recognized as being some 20 times greater than oral absorption. Secondly, and more importantly, has to do with the location of the prostate. When a suppository is inserted into the body, it rests some mere inches away from the prostate itself. It is this ability of a suppository to deliver ingredients directly to the prostate that makes it the optimal method of administration. Congratulations, you've now completed a crash course on prostate health. You know the six main causes of prostate problems as well as what ingredients can be taken, both preventatively and therapeutically. For more information on endosterol, a product that combines all the ingredients we've talked about, contact the healthcare provider who gave you this presentation. Let's start with inflammation. As we get older, chronic aches and pains can begin to accumulate in the body. Inflammation is an important part of the healing process but the chronic, unresolved inflammation associated with aging is definitely not beneficial. Chronic inflammation has also been associated with disease conditions, ranging from Alzheimer's and MS to heart disease and strokes. Clearly, inflammation is a problem that needs a solution. Unfortunately, many of the anti-inflammatory drugs used in the past have had disastrous side effects that have only shown up years later after their initial introduction. This is because pharmaceutical drugs work by overriding the body's natural biochemical pathways. All the pathways in the body are interconnected, and by manipulating one, you always inadvertently apply pressure to others. You can do this in the short run, but over time, it can cause problems. Current examples of this include the terrible side effects found with Vioxx and Celebrex, including increased risk of heart attacks, strokes, and blood clots. The only way we can be sure of avoiding unforeseen side effects is to work with nature, not against it. In nature, the inflammation pathway is controlled through the fats and oils in our diet. Certain oils and fats increase inflammation and others decrease it. Luckily, nature has supplied us with the saw palmetto plant. Saw palmetto oil works by inhibiting the same lipoxygenase and cyclooxygenase inflammation pathways that the pharmaceutical drugs do, but it does so in a manner that nature intended and is familiar with, that is, through dietary oils. Let's move on to circulation problems. In dealing with circulatory problems, there are two main issues to address, and they are blood viscosity and plaque. Blood viscosity refers to how thick the blood is, how prone it is to forming clots. We need our blood to clot to prevent us from bleeding to death from injuries, but when the blood becomes too thick, clots begin to form inside the body in the arteries and in the veins. These clots can decrease the flow of blood, leading to fatigue if they are small and strokes and heart attacks if they are large. Fortunately, saw palmetto in general and beta-cetosterol in particular both inhibit platelet aggregation, which is what causes the blood to clot. Let's look at the second issue raised, that of plaque. Plaque are the blockages that grow inside the arteries obstructing blood flow. Scientific studies have shown that beta-cetosterol supports the removal of fat directly out of arterial plaque. Many people think that all they need to do to take care of their circulation is to keep their cholesterol low. The truth is, it isn't the fat in the bloodstream that causes the problem, but rather the fat in the plaque itself. 
while lowering cholesterol may look good on a blood test, the real key is lowering the fat in the plaque and keeping the blood thin. Still, if a good blood test is important to you, you will be happy to hear that beta-cetosterol has also been clinically shown to support the lowering of LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. Immune function is the second issue we will address in this chapter. While most people believe that a stronger immune system is a better immune system, the truth is that what we really want is a strong and balanced immune system. A person suffering from allergies has a strong but unbalanced immune system. A person suffering from an autoimmune disease also has a strong but unbalanced immune system. To understand the concept of immune balance, we will compare the immune system of a person to the internal and external security of a ritzy nightclub. In a nightclub, there are doormen and bouncers. The job of the doormen is to make sure that only the right sorts of people are allowed in. The job of the bouncers is to wander around inside the nightclub and toss out anyone that starts causing trouble. In order for the nightclub to operate successfully, there needs to be a balance between the doormen and the bouncers to keep the nightclub running smoothly. On the other hand, if the doormen are too aggressive and the bouncers are too passive or vice versa, the nightclub will have problems. Let's look at the first scenario, overly aggressive doormen and passive bouncers. With overly aggressive doormen, perfectly good clients will be denied entry to the club. With passive bouncers, anyone who does get in and then causes a problem won't be removed. This type of immune imbalance is paralleled by a person with continual allergies and colds. The overly aggressive doormen reacting to clients that aren't a problem is analogous to a person allergic to things like cat hair or ragweed, things that pose no real threat to their health. The passive bouncers, letting clients get drunk and cause problems inside the nightclub, are analogous to a weak immune system, low on natural killer cells, unable to get rid of infections and cancer cells. Now, let's look at the second scenario, passive doormen and overly aggressive bouncers. With passive doormen, anyone can get into the club. With overly aggressive bouncers, peaceful and valuable clients are tossed out, and the fights between the bouncers and normal folk just there to have a nice time are always breaking out. This type of immune imbalance is paralleled by a person with an autoimmune problem. The overly aggressive bouncers fighting with peaceful patrons that aren't doing anything wrong is analogous to a person whose immune system is attacking their own body's tissues, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, or MS. You can see now that before we attempt to strengthen an immune system, we should first balance it. Sometimes strengthening an immune system only makes matters worse by increasing allergic and autoimmune responses. Fortunately, beta-cetosterol has the unique ability of being able to balance the immune system, the doormen and the bouncers, so to speak. For those of you who are more scientifically minded, Beta-cetosterol has an adaptogenic effect on Th1 and Th2 ratios. It is this ability of beta-cetosterol to balance the immune system that gives it the seemingly magical ability to support such a wide range of immune disorders. The last issue we will address is that of female health. Based on everything we have discussed in the first part of this presentation regarding the prostate, it may come as a surprise to learn that the ingredients in endosterol are also beneficial for supporting female health. In fact, saw palmetto has a long history of use for both men and women. It has been used as a reproductive tonic for women, increasing libido, fertility, and increasing milk flow in nursing mothers. It has also been prescribed to relieve painful periods, to regulate the menstrual cycle, and for pelvic inflammatory conditions, including 
salpingitis and ovarian pain. It has even been used to increase the weight of the uterus in postmenopausal women. Saw palmetto also has an affinity for the urinary system and has been taken to relieve urinary infections and fluid retention. This brings us to the end of this presentation. We started talking about a product for the prostate, continued with circulation, inflammation, and immune disorders, and ended discussing women's health. That's one of the nice things about working with natural ingredients. Instead of getting unexpected side effects, you get unexpected side benefits. You start working on helping one problem and you end up helping lots of problems that you didn't even know were related. I hope this information has been helpful to you. If you have any questions about how endosterol can support your health, gums are very sturdy. They have to be. All day long, they have to burn up fats and detoxify poisons. But they have a specific weakness, an Achilles heel, if you will, and that is phthalates. Phthalates are the chemicals that are added to plastics to make them more flexible. Phthalates give us products like styrofoam cups, Ziploc bags, Tupperware containers, plastic wrapped foods, plastic lined milk and juice cartons, and of course, plastic water bottles. Plastic water bottles can be the worst offenders because the more pure the water, the more phthalates will leach into it from the plastic bottle. It's a cruel irony that health-conscious people who drink bottled water are actually taking in more toxins from their plastic water bottles than they would get from drinking unfiltered city tap water. Even little babies get soft plastic teething toys, plastic pacifiers, and plastic formula bottles containing phthalates. Phthalates are also found in clothing, toys, cosmetics, perfumes, nail polishes, hairsprays, skin creams, mosquito repellents, toothbrushes, car interiors, hoses, paints, vinyl, sealants, adhesives, and the list goes on. Look around you. Phthalates are everywhere. Now, if these phthalates were to stay in their host products, life would be fine, but they don't. You see, phthalates aren't chemically bound to the materials they are added to. They leak into our water, into juice, into milk, and into the foods they are supposedly protecting. They leak out of the clothes we wear and pass into our bodies through our skin. They off-gas from our floors, walls, cars, and furniture, and migrate into our lungs. Once in our bodies, phthalates wreak havoc with our endocrine system, cause birth defects and cancer, damage our mitochondria and liposomes, and most relevant to this presentation, phthalates poison our peroxisomes. The first signs of phthalate toxicity showed up in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, where injured soldiers would occasionally go into shock and die within minutes of being given blood from plastic IV bottles. Before that time, blood was stored in glass bottles, but in 1948, with the invention of plastic blood storage bags, the military abandoned the storage of blood in glass bottles since they were too easily broken in a wartime environment. Unfortunately, the phthalates leaked from the plastic bags into the stored blood and then were poured directly into those poor soldiers' bodies. Many good men died not from their wounds but from phthalate toxicity. Medical researchers who noticed that a greater number of men died of shock in these modern wars attributed that fact to the hotter climates, but phthalates were the more likely culprit. Now, peroxisomes can take a lot of damage. In fact, they are specifically built to be able to break down toxic chemicals, but they can't handle phthalates. And these are the very toxins to which we are most frequently exposed. In fact, phthalates are the number one toxin in the body. An amazing three milligrams of them may be absorbed in a single day. Put another way, you will eat, drink, or inhale over 18 teaspoons of phthalates in your lifetime. Many health-conscious people now eat organic foods to minimize their pesticide exposure, which, of course, is an excellent idea. 
But what they are unaware of is that phthalates are even more toxic than many pesticides, and that in an average day, we absorb many more phthalates than we do pesticides. So to keep the peroxisomes healthy, the first thing you have to do is to get the plastic out. You can do this by minimizing your exposure to plastics. Unfortunately, avoiding all plastics is virtually impossible in the modern world, which brings us to the second thing we need to do. We need to actively remove the phthalates from our bodies. This can be accomplished in two ways. The first method is to take regular saunas. A certain amount of phthalates can be removed with a good old-fashioned sweat, and this is something each of us should be sure to do at least once a month. Unfortunately, this can only get rid of the phthalates that are in the skin and fat. To get the phthalates out of the deeper internal organs, we need to employ another technique. To get the deep-seated phthalates out of the body, we need to use our innate glutathione detoxification system. Glutathione is the body's main detoxifier, and fortunately, it can remove phthalates. Outside of detoxifying poisons, the main function of the peroxisomes is to burn fat. So when our cells sense that fat and oil consumption has increased, they produce more peroxisomes to help metabolize them. Likewise, if they sense that less fats and oils are being consumed, they decrease in number. One of the main ways that our cells determine how much fat and oil we are consuming is to monitor the level of cetosterols in our body. Since cetosterols are always found in fats and oils, this gives the cells a way to determine the amount being consumed and then to increase or decrease peroxisome production accordingly. This peroxisome regulation system worked flawlessly right up until the time fats and oils began being mass-produced in the last century. You see, fat and oil production companies don't like cetosterols. Cetosterols gum up their multi-million dollar processing equipment. They make their products cloudy and give them a taste and odor some people find objectionable. They also cause their products to have a shorter shelf life. So what did these companies do? <laughs> you guessed it. They filtered out all the cetosterols from their products. So what happens when you eat these unnatural cetosterol-free foods? The cells are misled into thinking that the fat and oil consumption is much lower than it actually is. Over time, this causes a decrease in the number of peroxisomes. Since peroxisomes burn fat in the cells, less peroxisomes mean less fat burning capability. This can cause fat to be put in storage around the body and not just in the thighs and around the waist. In fact, fat can accumulate virtually anywhere in the body. When fat accumulates in the arteries, it is called atherosclerosis. Fat accumulation under the skin is called cellulite. Fat can and does accumulate in every organ, including the heart, brain, lungs, nerves, liver, bone marrow, and the spleen, to name but a few. So what can we do? First, stop eating refined fats and oils. In this manner, your cells won't be blindsided by fats and oils they can't sense. Second, consider increasing your intake of cetosterols. This way, you can stimulate the production of more peroxisomes and start the process of burning all that accumulated fat out of your body. According to the Centers for Disease Control, 57% of Americans are overweight and nearly one quarter of our population is clinically obese. Detoxification, diet, exercise, and peroxisomes. A complete weight loss program must take all four of these subjects into consideration. So let's recap. Every cell has peroxisomes in them, whose job it is to burn fat and detoxify poisons. Peroxisomes are under continual attack by the most common of all poisons in the human environment, phthalates. Peroxisomes are also artificially decreased in number 
due to cetosterols being processed out of our foods. The decreased number of peroxisomes in our cells can lead to fat deposition in all the organs of our bodies, as well as an accumulation of many chemical toxins that the peroxisomes would otherwise neutralize. The solution is fourfold. One, to avoid phthalates whenever possible. Two, to break into a good sweat at least once a month to sweat out some of the phthalates. Three, to support our glutathione detoxification systems so we can detoxify those phthalates we can't sweat out. And four, to increase our cetosterol intake so as to stimulate.